I'd like to welcome you to Lecture 1 of Anatomy and Physiology, and what we're going to be doing today is looking at Chapter 1 of your book, The Human Body and Orientation. Um, so what I'd like to do is give a little review of, again, some um, terminology. So when we look at the concept of what is anatomy, um, it is basically the study of structure, and we're going to see in your book that anatomy is subdivided into what they call gross anatomy or macroscopic, and we're going to see a lot of this today in this first chapter, looking at body regions, surface, surfaces, and body cavities. And then we're going to um, look at eventually some of the microscopic anatomy later on as we look at what's called histology, which is the study of tissues, and then cytology, which is the study of the cells that make up those tissues. And as we go through the semester, I'm going to bring in some points that are not measured much in your book is a concept of developmental anatomy. And this means how does our adult anatomy get to be what it is because that explains a lot of uh, pathologies that we'll see in this class and it also tells you a lot about the origins of tissues and why certain conditions that affect let's say muscles might affect other things based on their embryological or developmental properties. Um, when we look at the term physiology and understand that when we study this anatomy and physiology are typically studied separately this whole idea of looking at the structure of something and then the um, function of it. So physiology is more of the function of what we'll look at. And you're going to find out that um, when we look at a structure, we can hypothesize a lot about the function. And we usually confirm that by doing certain types of tests of measuring the function of that structure. But also, we can determine the health of a structure or what the structure would look like pathologically by measuring the physiology. So when we start doing blood work, you'll be studying the functions of cells without seeing the cells, but you could predict what those cells look like based on what they're doing. So there's this be a very strong link between anatomy and physiology. And this is kind of a little review from the class orientation. We talked about these levels of organization. So as we again progress through the chapter, we're going to have to know a little about atoms because atoms are very important in making up these materials called molecules in the body. And your body uses atoms, particularly things we're going to call electrolytes, and also molecules which build the body and carry out functions. We're going to have to understand them and how they do the job for the body. And if you take courses in pharmacology uh, or medicine, these are going to be very two important categories that explain how we work. Because all of the functions that we look at today, and the, particularly the basis of pathology, pharmacology and how the environment affects the body is to be looking at how molecules behave because molecules and atoms are affected by body temperature, they're affected by um, uh, the aqueous environment, they are uh, affected by their interactions with each other and interaction with other environmental factors. And then we're going to move to the cellular level which is the actual what we call the living component of the body. So when we look at how atoms and molecules contribute to body, we look at that mostly cause the function of cells. And of course, cells don't work individually. I mean, they do work as individuals, but they clump together in units we can eventually call tissues and eventually into larger accumulations called organs. So we do have to understand a little about cell metabolism and how molecules within that cell function and also how the environment interacts with cells because that then predicts um, how tissues behave and how organs behave and eventually how the organism itself responds uh, to disease and responds to environmental factors. So we're going to spend a lot of our time today too towards the end of this lecture is a little about um, organ systems. And um, this is just a quick introduction to look at the um, classification of organ systems. And you're going to see that this varies from book and book to book and through the web. Because a lot of times now we're not classifying the endocrine system as a separate system, but actually part of the other organ systems. We're going to see that each of these organ systems shown here, the integumentary, nervous, muscular, skeletal, and circulatory, are all have endocrine components. And a lot of times what we do too is a lot of uh, 
people combine the muscular with the skeletal into the skeletal muscular system. And sometimes people tease out from the circulatory system something called a lymphatic system. So, and, and what's left out of here too are other systems like um, um, respiratory. So this is just a, a, a sampling of the um, different types of systems. And also the digestive system is missing from this too. So when we look at organ systems, the, the organ systems themselves are interrelated. And this is kind of interesting when you look at medicine, because medicine went from a very general approach, what we call a holistic approach, to um, a systemic approach to make things easier by teasing apart and trying to understand the diseases of organ systems. So you have medical specialties like neurology, uh, um, ear, nose, throat. You have um, people that study gastroenterology and even as specific as proctology, looking at the other end of the body, the digestive system. But all of these are just part of a big picture uh, of looking at and, and trying to categorize what the major features of that disease is. So probably all diseases affect the whole body. But what we try to do is break it down into what organ system is having that greatest effect on the body. But the newest, you know, idea today in medicine is to go back like we did in the past and work together to come up with again this holistic view. Basically, you know, how does each organ system how does medicine now really impact the function of the body. So we're getting now back to a little more of what's called holistic medicine. And we know that, you know, we can have a cardiologist come in and study the heart and what it's doing to a patient, but also other specialists have to be there to, to basically expand that knowledge and say, this is how it affects the body overall. And if the heart is treated, what's that gonna do to the rest of the body? Because in the past, we just blindly worked on one organ system without taking into account the others, and it led to a pretty you know, poor success rate on medical treatments, and particularly with the administration of drugs. So um, when we look at organ systems, I'm just gonna give you a brief on this, because later on, in, you know, we're gonna march through these throughout the class. So let's first look at the different organ systems. And then again, summarize that at the end as how this applies to everything else we're going to cover. So we have what's called the integumentary system, which is a very large organ system and is responsible for many different things, including heating and cooling of the body, um, perceiving senses, probably much more so than your eyes and ears, it, it, it perceives the outside environment for you. And we know in cases of sensory deprivation and uh, deprivation in like zero gravity environments, because I've now been working on understanding the physiology of space flight and working with uh, astronauts and setting policies on this when people go into space, is that when you're in a minus gravity, you have issues with the body as far as not being able to sense things, and it, and it really affects the other organ systems, particularly the nervous system. And it's also true of divers, where too much um, uh, receptor, what we call receptor stimulation to the body can cause issues. Uh, we can see the integrity system is very protective, and, it, and, and it, it also is involved in the synthesis of vitamin D and other compounds. And we're gonna see that the organs that make it up that means the organs, skin itself is just an organ, not an organ system. So you see skin, hair, and nails as being major features of the integumentary system. And then we have the skeletal system, which again is sometimes lumped with the skeletal muscular system because they're both derived from similar you know, embryological tissue and some creatures are somewhat indistinguishable some from each other. So we're going to see that this is involved in protection, support, and most importantly, movement in the body. And little, and we, and we know that there's also a very important role in blood cell formation here during later embryological development of the body and in adulthood, because we've learned that now actually the liver migrates a lot of the cells in the fetus to the bone to be a secondary site for blood cell formation. And you see that the skeleton plays a very big role in uh, having its own endocrine function in regulating the body. So now we have the muscular system, which you're gonna see is primarily made up of what are called skeletal muscles. We're gonna also see that there are 
other types of muscles too, cardiac and smooth muscles, which are usually found in internal organs. So with the skeletal muscles, we're looking at what's called a superficial system that it primarily amounts for movement and it, it's uh, and posture and also support because for example your internal organs a lot are supported by uh, a muscular system particularly abdominal muscles you're going to see that our own upright stance of walking uh, creates a problem where the organs are not uh, uh, supported properly by the abdominal muscles because they're still developed or believe it or not a four-legged movement that means us walking on our hands and knees in in what we're going to later call a, pr a prone position so the muscular system is going to be very complex we're going to understand a lot of its physiology this semester okay uh, because it is so critical for the body and a lot of its physiology is also um, similar to what we'll cover in the uh, nervous system so the principles you learn about muscle function is also going to apply a lot to nervous system function and speaking of nervous system, now we're going to look at the nervous system here. And we're going to see that it's inclusive organs in itself, which are called nerves. Nerves are each an organ. And we're going to see they're composed of different types of nerve cells and what are called assist cells called um, neuroglia or, or glial cells. There's the brain. And then there's a spinal cord, which almost act separately, but are also tightly integrated and also associated with um, receptors that are found all throughout the body we'll see we'll talk about special receptors that that pick up very specific senses that are unique to um, particular organisms and then we're going to talk about the external receptors that help you detect the in other you know environmental conditions and internal receptors or visceral receptors which help you to under understand what's going on inside your body and then there's the endocrine system which again, some of us now don't consider it an actual system in itself that stands alone. And we're going to see now there's what's going to be called the endocrine system proper. That's proper, P-R-O-P-E-R, -E which means we can actually look at and identify those organs and see a specific organ that is sometimes functional during human development early on, like the uh, thymus gland, and, and is not as functional as a child in a uh, as in a child and the same would be true actually for the um, gonads the testes and ovaries I'm going to see some endocrine uh, organs that function throughout the life and sometimes improve as a person ages um, so the endocrine system is responsible mostly for the production of what we call hormones or or long distance signals it's a way that the body communicates with itself and and regulates itself and um, we're going to see also there's going to be something called a diffuse endocrine organs and that means hormone producing cells that are found spread out throughout all the other body organs but are not in large pockets and in organs that are identifiable to themselves so just be aware that I mean that the whole ideology of how we understand organ systems is changing over time. Then we have the cardiovascular system, which is composed of organs that we call blood vessels, and, and they are organs, and, and a large organ called the heart. And we're going to see that this is the main system for transporting blood, which carries nutrients, oxygen, carbon dioxide, wastes, and, and, and hormones throughout the body and the hormones were left out of here which is very important it also carries other types of uh, chemical signals too and maintains um, blood pressure which is essential we're going to see for function of the kidneys and also the respiratory system so this so when we look at cardiovascular this is one of those organ systems that significantly affects the function of the rest of the body now the lymphatic system is a is one of those systems that we don't know where to really put it. It might be part of the cardiovascular system. It might be also part of the um, digestive system, and a lot of it has to do with the fact of its relationship with the spleen. It might also be part of the skeletal system as an accessory to um, blood cell formation. So this is really kind of neat because it has its own organs in itself. But the main thing you're going to learn about the lymphatic system a little later is the fact that um, it, it 
it's involved heavily in the immune response and not only storing immune system cells, but also their maturation and helping the immune system to identify foreign objects in the body that we're going to eventually call, um, ant call antigens. It also is very important in regulating fluids in the body. And the lymphatic system is very sensitive to atmospheric pressure, to too much gravity, too little gravity. We're finding this now with space flight and airplane flight that that gravity is essential for this system to work, and so is movement. So as you move your body, we learned that this also facilitates the function of the lymphatic system, and we're going to cover this later throughout the course. Then we have the respiratory system, which, believe it or not, is embryologically derived from the digestive system. So in many creatures, these are linked, and they're, and and you sometimes defects. Of the, of the digestive system development can affect respiratory system development. So we're going to see that the respiratory system works together intimately with the cardiovascular system to ensure that uh, atmospheric gases exit and leave the body. And the respiratory system is also very important for waste because uh, metabolic waste, of course, carbon dioxide is one of those, but also is urea and other gases. That, and waste that are found in the blood. And we're going to see that the integumentary system does a similar thing. It's also in control of waste through the sweat. Um, in many animals, the respiratory system is also involved in, in water balance, too. So the, and, and the respiratory system also has its own endocrine function. So, this, so again, we're going to cover this a little later this semester, and you're going to have to spend a time, a lot of time, understanding that the function of the respiratory system is mostly dependent on the atmospheric conditions of the environment, particularly the levels of oxygen and CO2, because all the respiratory system basically does is pump air into the lungs. But basically, what happens is that it's the atmospheric pressure that allows gases like oxygen to enter the blood from the lungs and also CO2 to leave the blood. So just think of the respiratory system as a pump that puts the atmosphere into the lungs where gas exchange could occur. But if the conditions are not right, that means you're in a low oxygen environment, like being in high altitude or in a room that is on fire where the oxygen is being consumed, you're going to be getting atmosphere into your lungs, but not necessarily oxygen into the body itself. And in converse, CO2, if carbon dioxide is high the outside, you're not going to release it from the blood into the lungs. And again, you're going to be talking about later on in the semester, uh, in this course, carbon dioxide partial pressure and something called oxygen partial pressure. Now we get to the digestive system, which is an incredible system jam-packed into your body. I mean, we're looking at 30-something feet of tubing and swollen tubes that are squished into your body. Now, we're going to see that the digestive system is made up of various organs, has a very strong endocrine function, and also a strong neural function that controls something called satiation in your body. So when you eat, we're going to see that there's three processes that go on. There's going to be basically the process of ingestion and a basically mechanical breakdown of food to make it smaller to the point where you can chemically digest it. And then there's the beta's process called absorption, which is separate than breaking down the food. Because absorption means that the food can actually go ex exchange with the bloodstream, very much like we talked about with the respiratory system. So you have a separate system that allows things in and out. And this is also going to be based on environmental factors we're finding out, particularly the amount of food you eat and the condition of the blood. The third step is going to be what's called a satiation response. That means as you eat and absorb food, you're going to have neural and hormone pathways that tell you whether you've ate or not or whether you need to eat. And this is going to interact with an area called the limbic system of the brain, which she's missing hers right now, um, that basically allows your behavior to adapt to that and also allows that system to adapt to behavior. We're also seeing that food, your diet, has what's called an epigenetic influence over the third phase of digestion that sometimes tells you, I like fats. We sometimes call these cravings, and we learn that you're not born with these, but these are taught over time. Like, I like salt, I like fats, or all sometimes subtly learned cravings based on sometimes even what your mom ate 
while she was pregnant with you. And then there's the urinary system. Okay, and sometimes we blend this with the urogenital system because in humans, these are actually de developmentally the same. Believe it or not, kidneys those are, uh, derive from the same uh, uh, um, embryological tissue as, as uh, your gonads in some animals. These are um, uh, two distinct systems, but in us, they tend to be kind of a blended system that work together, but we can still tease certain components apart. So we're going to talk about the kidney, which is, again, this is a type of system which requires absorption to remove wastes, and this, we're going to see, is heavily dependent on blood pressure and also on how well your digestive system and your um, um, uh, um, integumentary system are regulating waste removal and food uptake, nutrient uptake. You can, we're going to have the ureter and urinary bladder and urethra, which help to drain the kidney to allow it to keep functioning. So this is going to be a little temporary storage area for waste. We're going to see that the liver is involved in this, which is part of the digestive system, because it actually produces a safe waste product called urea to be transported into blood that gives the, the kidney something to remove. And last but not least is the reproductive system, which in many creatures, they have the same, they have two sexes present in one, and some basically don't have a sex actually at all, okay? But we have two distinct genders, and what I mean by two distinct, that means absolute distinct. There are actually five to seven ways of classifying humans based on the degree of development of what we call the external genitalia, or the internal ones. That means the actual functional parts themselves. So we have the anatomical features and the more physiological features. Uh, and we're gonna see that a lot of this is dependent on how a fetus is able to control the development of basically simple tissues that develop either a penis or a vagina and also control this thing called an uncommitted gonad. And your body, we're gonna also see, produces a compound called um, androgen, which naturally develops in the testosterone unless that is suppressed in the male, okay, I mean, in the female to produce estrogen, or it's encouraged in the male to produce testosterone. And do understand that there are, uh, testosterone can be produced in males and females by other uh, organ systems, particularly, we're gonna learn the adrenals in the endocrine system can produce testosterone in females, which is a natural thing. So the, the um, the, um we look at human reproduction, very simple genetic cues basically turn us into a male or a female. We start out sort of like a neutral thing. And there's a misconception that we all start out female, but it's only true on the outside. And that's not necessarily true because the, the uh, external parts, the labia and the female in itself is not fully developed. And a child does not have adequate sexual development. So before we move on to looking at the actual surface features and how do we orient the body and understanding the orientation, um, we do have to understand that the body in itself, from a holistic perspective, we have to look at two major features of the body to understand itself. One feature called homeostasis, or what we call the necessary life functions. What does a body do to keep itself alive? And we can look at this from what's called the somatic or body level, or we can look at it from the cellular level or what we call the molecular biological level. Both are important, but usually when we give medications, what we're looking at it has a molecular biology. How do we target that molecular biology to affect the whole body in itself, basically from the gross or the systemic or the you know, homeostatic level. So what we're gonna see that some necessary life functions are gonna be the whole idea that your anatomy separates the body from the environment so that we can maintain our own internal environment and also help to boundary ourselves from the external environment so we can maintain an internal consistency like temperature or fluid content compared to the environment. That's why it can be 100 degrees outside and your body still retains about 98.6. And we should actually talk about uh, um, 
Celsius for this perspective. There's a lot, uh, I know in America we measure in Fahrenheit, but really when we look at anatomy and physiology, we deal with the universal units of Celsius. So body temperature would be actually 37 degrees. And actually there's not one number. We're gonna see that homeostasis involves a range that's called an acceptable range of maintaining the body. So we're gonna talk about plasma membranes, which are found in the cell, membranes that protect us from the outside environment. We're gonna talk about uh, internal membranes that cover organs and separate them. We're gonna talk about things that separate individual nerve cells from each other. So each can function separately, but also work as units. But every one of your body cells are encased in boundaries that allow them to control their external environment, whether the external environment is the atmosphere or the external environment is other cells around them. You see, movement is a very important necessary life function for us. And it doesn't just mean movement of skeleton, but movement of stuff throughout the body, the movement of blood and other features we'll cover later. Responsiveness, that means how does my body respond to itself and to external stimuli? Because I've seen case after case where people do not respond to certain stimuli that we take for granted. Because imagine a life without pain. You would not only know that you don't feel pain, but you would not know that others do. And the body doesn't even know that you don't respond to pain. And it sometimes happens in a disease called leprosy, where people lose the nerve cells in the skin that respond to pain, and they will sit there smoking a cigarette or it burns down to their fingers, and they don't know it, and there's nothing to stop them. The brain can actually even look at it and say, hey, that's not a problem. Even though I'm smelling my own burning flesh and watching it burn, I don't see any problem with it. And that's kind of sad. So we're going to see things like withdrawal, reflex, controlling of breathing, digestion, cardiac rate, respiratory rate are all part of what's called responsiveness. And then, of course, there's the digestive process, which is very important, the breakdown of digest uh, and ingestion of foods and also the absorption of foods. And guys, one of the biggest killer of this is stress and improper diet. Remember that as a college student. There's also metabolism. And you're going to a little later about two types of metabolism, what's called catabolism, that means the breaking down of materials, and anabolism, think of the term anabolic steroid, that means we build up the body. So we're going to learn about the body breaking down materials, even its own self, to carry out functions, particularly to produce energy or new molecules. And then anabolism is the taking of raw materials to build up to what we need in the bodies. That means I, mean, I eat amino acids to build proteins. So we can look at anabolic and catabolic processes, and we'll do that briefly in this class. Uh, and I know this will be a lot of material when we cover particularly the metabolism, but you just have to know the general principles of how metabolism works to understand human survival. And then there's a process called excretion, and that just means the removal of waste, particularly metabolic waste and also the breakdown of cells and indigestible stuff. So we're going to look at uh, later in this course, urea, carbon dioxide, feces, and, and other factors that we, other features that we have to remove from the body, particularly if you eat plants, there's a lot of materials called metabolites that we have to remove from the body. Reproductive system. My gosh, I mean, how essential is this? This is part of our homeostasis. That means the ability to carry out not only reproduction to maintain our own body, that means asexual reproduction, but also the species of itself is important. So, uh, and we can see birth defects that impair our own cellular division or our own sexual cellular division, which is called uh, uh, um, uh, uh, sexual reproduction or meiosis. So we're gonna talk about something called mitosis which is a mechanism of how cells replace themselves to help us to grow and repair and replace cells. Because we're, we're, you're replacing, guys, millions of cells daily, and I can even probably say tens of millions of cells easily daily. Cells that either die or get worn out or we just need to replace to keep them fresh. And, and, um, and we're gonna see that just for healing process too. The healing process takes a lot of cell repair, and we're going to learn later that when your body is under damage, let's say you get uh, uh, you break an arm, it's going to take a lot of cellular division, which takes a lot of calories to do repair. So your caloric content 
is totally dependent on not just activity, but how much cellular division is going on in the body. And that's why young children per, you know, body size need a lot of more calories than adult per body size, you know, uh, um, than an adult. Okay, because they, they, they have a lot of cellular division going on from cell replacement, what's called cell development, that means cells are changing their roles, and also for growth. Okay, and there again, growth, we're going to see is an increase in body size versus development, you're going to learn later, is a change in body function, which means an actual change in cell functions throughout the body. Um, and then we have part of our survival needs too, the intake of nutrients. Okay, you need materials to use as raw materials. That means to build the body and also materials to provide the body with energy so that we can run things called enzymes. So your your diet is going to be composed of what we call um, uh, energy-based foods, which are usually which could be anything. But mostly for your body, you're adapted to carbohydrates as your primary energy food. That means they go solely for the production of running cells and running things called enzymes, particularly. That's where most of your calories go. Enzymes allow you to move, they allow you to break down foods, allow you to build new molecules. And then we're gonna see that there are foods that are involved mostly in growth. And this is gonna be not so much carbohydrates, but things called fats, very much so. Children need a lot of fats, believe it or not, in their diet, particularly things called phospholipids like DHA to maintain the growth and development of their nervous system and also of the muscular system. We see that proteins are essential and, and other molecules called vitamins we can see are essential for, function, for assisting function. And so the same is true for minerals. Minerals are going to need for growth and function. Okay. We also need oxygen which we're going to see is a major molecule associated with function for energy. So we're going to see that oxygen is heavily linked to how carbohydrates primarily do their job in your body. They're going to help carry, it helps carry out something called cellular respiration. Water is critical, not only because your body is in what we call an aqueous environment. That means your body is basically dissolved in water and requires water for transport and support and much of your body structure, but also because um, water dissolves and transports a lot of the compounds you need for your own survival. So water we're going to see is very critical. It also maintains some, to maintain something called the osmotic balance or the, uh, the salinity of your body. It also maintains something called the pH, which are all factors that affect how enzymes and, and other body chemicals do their job. We can also see that water maintains the shape of your molecules. Body temperature affects the rate how chemical reactions occur, but also affects the shape of molecules. And we're gonna see that the body has a very narrow range of temperatures that it can tolerate. And we mean internal temperatures, not external. So you don't wanna get much below 50 degrees Fahrenheit on the inside of your body, because that leads to severe uh, hypothermia, and you don't want to get much above 110 to uh, uh, on the inside of your body, because that can then lead to uh, basically metabolic breakdown because the enzymes can't do their job adequately, and they basically stop. Now, some people believe that it causes curdling of the blood, but that is not necessarily true. That doesn't occur too much later. Okay, when you start getting into the 150 range of the internal, but that means your body is dead and warming up in response to the environment. Um, we need appropriate atmospheric pressure. That means you need what's called one atmosphere gas. And this is something I've been working on with space flight right now, is I didn't realize that, um, you know, when you go into a space suit, they have to have a very carefully set atmospheric pressure that doesn't kill the astronaut with too much atmospheric gas, which can literally bubble out of the blood and actually rupture open tissues, but also they have to have enough to carry out minimum body functions. And we have to have a, an appropriate atmospheric component too. That means you have to about what's called about 0.04% CO2 concentration in your body to adequately give off CO2. You also have to have a very high, what's called partial pressure of oxygen to take in oxygen in your body and a certain level of what's called atmospheric nitrogen or inert gas. And the inert gas could actually be anything, but the inert gas to maintain a certain level of 
exchange and gas pressure in your body. And astronauts suffer from this. And this is also true when people undergo airplane flight. They keep airplanes at about a little less than what's the normal condition for proper atmospheric ventilation. And this is also influenced by altitude. And again, by atmospheric pressure, it means if you're in the air or in water. So the take home word for looking at survival is this concept of homeostasis, which means how does my body return to its unique normal set point? Everybody has a unique normal set point. And this changes with age from when you're a fetus all the way to your elderly. And guys, when you start hearing about things like hormone replacement and all this other stuff for elderly people, that you don't want to return an elderly person to what they were when they were 30 because that is not their homeostatic set point anymore. So certain things deplete for a purpose, not because you're pathological. And not everybody has the same ranges of set points. And we're learning this with space travel that certain people, you put them in a spacesuit, they do well. You put them in a high speed jet, they do well. Others will die, others can outperform. And this is what's neat about when you, when you look at NASA astronauts. They were purposely uh, selected for and trained for a particular homeostasis. Others won't cut it. And people die in environments that other people live in. You look at the uh, Nepalese people that act as Sherpers that go high up into the mountains. They could breathe at altitudes other people take. They could, they could withstand extremely cold temperatures that other people become hypothermic. So we're going to see that the body is not even steady over time. It's dynamic. This is why you have to take multiple measures of blood pressure, of blood chemicals, and of even breathing rate, whatever, over short periods of time because of how dynamic the body is. So the body is not the specifically set thing. Homeostasis means I'm operating with parameters that keep me alive. And it doesn't mean perfectly alive. It doesn't mean do I live to 80. It just means it gets me through to the point where I survive. And we've learned this from our own ancestors who ancient peoples lived to maybe 47 years old. Some live longer depending on their genes and depending on the luck of what they ate and where they lived. But you know, and but living to 47 was okay because they still procreated. So our homeostasis is not even set to, to make you live to 80. It aims at reproduction, reproductive age, and after that point, it just gets you along. That sounds kind of fatalistic, but that is very true when we look at our body. So when we get into homeostatic control mechanisms, we're going to deal with this with every organ system. It's going to involve continuous monitoring by things called receptors, monitoring the internal part of the body, the external monitoring cells, monitoring cells, organs, monitoring organs, and communicating with each other. And usually this is done through the nervous and what we call the endocrine components of the body. And so when we look at this a little later, particularly when we get into the nervous system and endocrine system, we're going to talk about mechanisms called receptors. And think of them like sensors, like a thermostat. They monitor the environment, sometimes general, sometimes specific things. They can monitor temperature, pressure, chemicals that we sense as smell. They can measure pressure sometimes as touch or actually, you know, vibration, which is how we basically determine, uh, detect heat. We have control set, uh, centers, which take the information from the receptor and pass it through to the emotional uh, uh, center of the brain, being the limbic system. And this helps you to perceive what something is. Because some people perceive signals as pain or pleasure, the same signal. And some people don't perceive hunger signals the way others do. So when we look at the control center, there's going to be an absolute response in which receptors are directly communicating with the brain for what we call an appropriate response. And then there's what's called the, the um, perception, not the reception, but the perception okay, of pain. And the perception is what is how your body has learned to adapt the brain to that environment. So you have reception. okay which allows the body to carry out homeostasis and then perception, which gives you flexibility or preferences on how the body does that. And then there's things called effectors. 
And this is what now, when the brain realizes what's going on and if something has to be done, do effectors carry that job out? And effectors can cause movement, they can produce a secretion, they can carry out a metabolic change, they can cause growth, whatever, it can stimulate cells to replicate. There's thousands and thousands and thousands of effective responses. So you're gonna hear about the term effector or an effective response. You can also hear something that's called afferent and efferent. Afferent means a stimulus is coming in. Efferent means an effector is doing something that's making that a response that goes out throughout the body. So as we look at control, think of your body as being in this balance that could tether at an angle that eventually it's at what your body perceives as an imbalance. So your body is constantly like two people on a seesaw or teeter-totter or lever, or whatever you want to call this, where you're constantly rocking back and forth based on hundreds of stimuli from afferent pathways, that means incoming pathways from your receptors to the control center and then to efferent pathways or effectors that do the job of regulating. And we can see, so let's look at this stepwise right now. So as the stimulus comes in, a stimulus can cause an imbalance in the body that pushes it to the point where the body is noticing that. And it's not going to always be a tiny adjustment. Sometimes this imbalance has to be big to the point where the body then initiates what's called a receptor. So the receptor is looking at, hey, this is getting a little out of range. So you might not feel this at all, but your body eventually is going to start noticing this. So we get to this extreme point of imbalance. And what happens then is the receptor sends out a chemical, or it could be a neural impulse, okay, that then goes to the control center. And depending on that stimulus, it can go to various control centers in the body, in the brain, in the spinal cord, or in the case of the endocrine system, to various targets throughout the body. And then the control center, wherever it is, does an output, which we call efferent response or pathway, and that affects an, e an effector whose job now is to produce the response that hopefully returns it to here. And guys, sometimes there's an over-response that puts it into an imbalance. You're gonna learn that this is how the nervous system functions. It goes from a resp uh, an initial imbalance and puts it into another imbalance to basically the seesaw is now somewhat stable again, but always rocking a little back and forth. So sometimes a response, like we see with the immune system and other things, gets pushed out and then we have a secondary response. That means other receptors come in to push that response back to normal in this constant rock, gentle rock and back and forth model. So we're gonna learn also about something called feedback. Feedback just means how does my body know when a response is coming in and how to react? So there's different types of feedback. That means how do I adjust the body? Something called negative feedback just means the body is pushed away from a normal condition and I push it back. That's all it really means. And don't worry about how the hypothalamus works or whatever, but just make believe your body is low in food. Your hypothalamus can get a signal. It can send a signal throughout the body. And what that can do is um, cause your body to eat. Food molecules get into the body. The food molecules send a signal, let's say, I'm not hungry anymore, and shuts that down. So there can be various responses that go on with the body and the signaling of the body. And this is where particularly your limbic system of the brain, the emotion system of the brain comes in that helps you to consciously think about this stuff. And not everything goes through that. Some things go through what are called autonomic pathways where you're, you are consciously not paying attention to what's going on. And, and, and your, this example here has to do with uh, urination. How do I remove urine? This is a very important balance that occurs with controlling body fluids and waste removal. Okay, with kidney water balance, and water balance is associated a lot with waste production or just over drinking or under drinking. So when water gets low volume in your body, which is sometimes detected as blood volume or blood pressure, your body adjusts through this negative feedback. The body's low, I elevate it. If it's too high, I lower it. That's negative feedback. 
Now, with positive feedback, don't think of it the opposite as negative. It's a totally separate way of doing things. So with positive feedback, what you're trying to do is exaggerate or make more prominent the original stimulus. So what happens with negative feedback, the stimulus tends to counteract what's going on in the body. With positive feedback, it almost accelerates it or makes it greater. Now, why do you want to do this? This is very common sometimes in endocrine events, a lot of times in uh, the nervous system. But sometimes you want to cascade or amplify an effect. This is also very important. We're going to see in the immune, you know, particularly the immune system. But what happens, for example, with labor is you produce something called oxytocin, which actually helps to increase the labor. So one contraction releases oxytocin that causes contractions to become more and more and more. And then when eventually the contractions are not needed, we reach a critical point where the system does stop. And in some cases, it might not. And this can create problems. Um, when you get an injury, blood clotting is a cascade. That means you don't want to rely on just a slow blood clotting process that has the ability to shut itself down. You send up this fast condition that accelerates itself. So as a clot forms in a wound, the clot itself causes more clots to form. If that doesn't occur, you can bleed out. If it occurs too much, you can form clots that are abnormal. In the case of things like keloids, with tissue repair, uh, gets out of control when, when there's damage done to the body. Or you can have a person that clots too willingly and can actually develop clots throughout the bloodstream. So positive feedback is very unique. It's a lot of times involved in, uh, again, how the immune system works, and this can cause things like allergies. So an out of control positive feedback causes allergies. Out of control blood clotting can cause severe you know, damage to blood vessels, in the case even blockage of blood vessels. So again, with homeostatic imbalance, if we remain at imbalance, that means outside a range, not an absolute number, this obviously could increase our risk of disease. It also does something to the body called epigenetic programming. It means it actually adapts the body to be out of balance, and it does make you feel better and put the body under less stress, but could also lead to premature death. And unfortunately, in females, particularly young reproductive females, that imbalance could actually be affect the child that's being developed. Okay during embryological development, particularly during those earlier stages of embryology. So homeostatic imbalance might allow destructive positive feedback in many cases. And this is true of what's called congestive heart failure. So the way the uh, circulatory system interacts with the cardio, I mean, with the um, respiratory system, this can lead to death. And in some cases, this is normal in animals. You find animals that under severe cardiac uh, under severe nervous system stress, their body kills itself. So some, or it can even shut down in this case. So we can lead to sometimes what we call the fight, flight, die, dying syndrome. What's not going to be very fundamentally important to this class in understanding where organ systems are located and basically how the body is organized and literally how we use the body as a map. We're going to look at what's called the anatomical position and then look at the way we divide the body up into regions and also into planes and um, depth. So when we talk about the anatomical position, this is sort of like you're looking at a person face on, what we call the anterior view, and the body's going to be upright and erect, I mean standing up, the feet are going to be slightly apart, the palms are facing forward with the person's arms at their side and usually the feet are flat but um, some people debate that when you look at anatomical position that make believe you're standing on your heels with the bottom parts of your feet facing up so this is going to be the standard position that we use to determine um, up and down on the body left and right and um, you know again what we, we will call later on deep and superficial so when we look at the body either from in the anatomical position and you can see the hands forward feet in this case are flat person standing up arms by their side and the reason why we do this is that uh, particularly for x-ray you know no bones are overlapping you're literally looking at every bone faced on um, so what we're going to have to know in this class 
or literally all these terms, because this is very important when we start looking at um, anything from an x-ray to where to palpate a patient, where to stick a needle, where to you know put an IV, um, or just where to explain there's a scar. And I filled out forms before where I had to recognize, um, a, you know, mention that there was a bruise here, a bruise there. You don't say upper arm. You have to be very specific using these anatomical terms, which I know are based on Latin, Greek, and Italian. But we don't use the American words. Uh, what we stick with is a medical terminology. So, of course, we have the cephalic region here, which makes up the head. And you do have to be familiar with an area called the frontal region, which is right above your eyes, and you'll eventually learn about a frontal bone. The orbital region refers to where the eye is. The nasal is obviously the nose. You have the oral region for the mouth. And um, the mental region is the bottom of your chin, the, the point of your chin. Why do we need to know these? Eventually, this is going to these terms correlate with the naming of bones and the naming with um, what we call features on bones that tell us where major muscles are, maybe blood vessels and nerves. So the cervical area is going to be your neck, the thoracic region, which covers about all of this right here. Uh, it could be broken up into the axillary or your armpit, the mammary, okay, and also the sternum right here between the two mammary regions. The abdominal, we're going to look later on today how to divide that up. So you have the umbilical region right around here, and we're going to see we can divide this area right here in purple, okay, into uh, either uh, six or four regions. And some people break it up into more depending on how they divide the abdominal area. Then we have the pelvic area okay right about here okay and um, below it's going to be the inguinal area and how do you tell the pelvic area you will feel for um, the what's called the iliac crests right about here this was very important in x-ray and oriented films and also for needle sticks when uh, particularly with uh, biopsies on um, the pubic region you have here okay right near the inguinal region so these are two kind of connected okay and um, then we could also divide the body up into what we're looking at is the core body you're looking at right now or the axial part of the body this later on we're going to call the appendicular part of the body and we have of course the upper limb okay and the acromium um, is a term that refers to this right here this area in the top of your shoulder and you're going to learn about an acromion process which is a major attachment point for the rotator, tough, uh, rotator uh, cuff joint uh, brachial means arm please know that it's a very important term and then you have what's called the anti-cubital -cub uh, which means the little region in front of basically the elbow the cubitus or elbow is behind that um, we have the um, right here to anti break him and anti just means before so if you look at the hand this comes before the forearm okay when it comes to looking as the hand as the first part of the uh upper limb extension so anti usually means before or in front <clears throat> and again brachial means um basically arm type structure the carpus carpals refer to the wrist itself exactly that and later and the whole hand itself is called the manus and we're going to eventually break that down into the carpal uh the metacarpal region itself and metacarpal just means near the wrist and then these bones here into eventually the digits or the phalanges so you can see that there are some terms you'll learn a little later that are not on here and the polyx just has to do with a little region right where the um digital and palmar region come together okay it's that little wedge you see when you make a fist a little wedge inside the lower limb is going to have the cock uh, the hip or the coxal area right about here this is a very important point because of the hip joint a lot of pain here and some major uh, nerves pass by there you have the femoral region because of and that's named after what's called the uh, femur bone and there's a major vein there called the I mean, artery called the femoral artery also the femoral vein the patella is your fancy term for kneecap that's the patella region the crural region is actually the leg 
okay and we don't use that that much we do use the fibril or perineal region because that tells you where the um, uh, um, fibula is and then the tarsus or tarsal region is the literally the lower legs equivalent of the carpals so tarsals and carpals are basically the same uh, structural components to the bones and literally they are corollary bones then, uh, then you have the metatarsus, which makes up the major flat part of your foot, very much like the major palm of your hand. And of course, the digitals and then the hallux, which I don't see used that much, really. But please know these terms because uh, you will be tested on them and they will use them throughout the book to explain where certain features are located on the surface of the body or internally. So what are the terms for the posterior part of the body? Now, obviously... We don't have to go through upper limb all of that again, but um, we're going to see that we see some of the same structures from the anterior view, and now we're looking at the posterior or dorsal view. So you still see your brachial there. Now you see your lacrimal, okay? And this is sometimes called the cubitus, but also the lacrimal um, also refers to the lacrimal process. And I mentioned this in our introductory lecture that um, you're going to see sometimes a duplication of terms so some people say cubitus some people say olecranol but you're going to learn something called the olecranon process which is a very important part of the elbow joint there's your antibrachium again there's your metacarpal there's your digital that's your manus and for the leg the only new thing there is well a couple of new things there's the uh, popliteal which basically means the back of your knee the sorrel, which refers to the calf, because of course you don't see that in the front view or the anterior view. And there again is your fibula region, okay, or fibial region. And your foot again, this you don't see in the anterior view, your calcaneal region. This is basically, now look, he's standing on his toes. So be aware of that. This is your heel. And plantar refers to your foot. That's, I mean, that's because you plant it on the ground, basically. That's where the term basically comes from. So um, when we look at the cephalic region, we can see the ears a little better. That's your otic region, and very few people use that. But it's important to know. Your occipital refers to this area right here, and you'll learn about the occipital bone. That's literally a little above the neck where the head meets the neck. Uh, um, and you can see where, actually literally where the vertebral column attaches. And then there's your cervical right there. Scapular, of course, you can't see this from the front view. You can't see the vertebral column from the back view. So this is gonna be another region you need to know. This area is your lumbar. Okay, and I hear some people call this the small of your back, but please use the lumbar. Sacral's buried right there. Two bones that are going to be uh, prominent there, the bottom of the sacrum bone and also the uh, coccyx vertebrae, okay? Your gluteal actually refers to your cheeks, not those cheeks, but these cheeks. And your uh, perineal actually refers to not just, that's not your rear end, um, but basically this little area right here that's very important because that supports basically um, um, all the structures in that region of the abdomen. We, feel, we see that region causes, there's herniation there, there's a lot of issues with pregnancy there and obesity there. So that's your posterior view. And that was just the anterior view. Eventually you're gonna learn the posterior view in your lab books. So now when we look at body orientation, we have to explain relative position of one structure to another. And again, you're going to be in the, the, per, the person's going to be in the anatomical position when you're explaining this. So we have what's called the superior or the cranial position. And that means any part of the body that's closer to the head than to the feet. So we can say that the head is superior to the shoulders. The shoulders are superior to the chest and the chest is superior to the abdominal region. So this is pretty straightforward terminology. And, and, and we do have to notice, he's gonna use this a lot in explaining where body features are, uh, and even internal features, like the stomach is superior to the intestines. You're also gonna learn it's superior and lateral. And we'll see that um, a little later. And then there's inferior or caudal. 
because cranial is just another term for head. Caudal means your tail. So it means closer to the tail of your body. And technically, that should be your tail, but we're using your legs kind of like your tail. So we can say that the feet are superior, I mean, inferior to the ankles. And the ankles are inferior to your lower leg. Okay, and the chest is inferior to the head. So all of these we will see later. Again, they're very critical in using these terms to explain the human like a map and where are things oriented and directed. And then we have ventral and dorsal. And this means what is my view of the patient? So if I'm looking at this way, I have their ventral view. And this has to, you have to be very careful about this. A lot of people say anterior, but this is, these are not similar. With humans, since we stand on two legs, our anterior becomes our ventral. But if any of you ever deal with animals, four-legged animals, particularly in veterinary sciences, the anterior basically is your face, looking at your face, and your shoulders and chest with you on four legs, and also the front of your arms and legs in the animal's anatomical position. Now with humans, since you stand up, the ventral really means the belly. It means I'm just looking at your stomach. Now in a dog, you're not looking at the stomach when, it's, when you're seeing its anterior view, because it's below. So please be careful with that. But at least in human AMP, for most people, anterior is synonymous with ventral. The same holds true for dorsal. Dorsal means I'm viewing the back of that person. That is my view. This was very critical in positioning people um, for a physician, particularly positioning for x-rays or any type of examination. And then we have um, other terms that explain side to side, not just up and down and uh, back and front. So now we have medial, which just means right down the center. Okay, so for example, your shoulder blades are medial to your arm. Okay, your nose is medial to your eyes because it's more towards the center. So anything that is more towards the center than another structure is medial. Now the opposite is true for lateral. Your eyes are lateral to your nose. Your arms are lateral to your torso. So it just means towards this outer plane of the body. And then there's a term intermediate, which we don't use that much anymore, except maybe with locating very specific regions. So when we say medial, they can mean like uh, um, just it's the middle of two particular structures. So they will say something like it's medial to the mammary region. Okay, which you can also say lateral, but sometimes you'll have something on one side of the body that is right in the middle between two other structures. And they won't say lateral or, or medial because it really doesn't make sense to, you know, it, it's not really. It's in the middle of two major structures. So they will use the term intermediate. And then this one's a little more trickier. This has to do only with the appendages. So you only ter use these terms with the appendages. Because if you're dealing with the axial body, that means the main core of the body, okay, that uses inferior, superior. Don't use that for the appendages. These are treated a little differently. So when we look at the appendages, okay, um, we pay attention to the origin or the attachment point of that appendage. So when we look at the attachment point, that's considered proximal. Distal is the end of that appendage. And this is kind of funny because when we look at the arm and the forearm, it seems a little backwards, but that's just ancient terminology. So with the modern medical terminology, distal refers to like your toes, your feet, whereas proximal might refer a little more towards the kneecap, the elbow, and that would even sometimes be considered intermediate in the arm. And then the proximal would be the, um, let's say your, your rotator cuff joint, or it may be your hip joint. So again, review these. There'll be time in lab to do this. And then we're now looking literally into or outside of the body. 
So now we could use the terms what's called superficial. Superficial means closer to the skin, the outer surface of the body. And deep means towards the deeper parts of the body, further away from the skin. So when we start talking about superficial wounds, it just means it's on the surface of the skin. A deep wound means it could be anywhere below the skin, literally right down to the center of the body. So again, there's a fair amount of terminology here in this first chapter, but please, this is stuff we have to know and we'll be using it regularly when we get into the organ systems. So I mentioned this a little earlier, but the way we divide the body up is into two actually skeletal systems, and these actually are distinct skeletal systems that develop separately in the body. And you learn this a lot when you work with uh, birth defects. And I've learned this a lot working with uh, in animal pathology for a long time. So actually usually means the body axis. And that includes the head, neck, and trunk. Okay, it does not include the pelvic bones. It includes a vertebral column. So your head, neck, and trunk is axial. The appendicular includes your limbs and the pelvic bones, because the pelvic bones are equivalent to what we're gonna learn later, are like your scapulas, which is all part of the arm. So please be aware of this, because your rib cage is um, axial, but your arms and legs and pelvis and scapulas are not. So this helps us to divide the skeleton into two particular, not just anatomical regions, but develop. And the list goes on. Now we're gonna look at what's called body planes. And the best way to look at this, make believe I'm gonna slice a person with a chainsaw, which doesn't sound too pretty. It's actually quite gruesome. But what are the ways I can slice a person? So when I'm looking at them microscopically or cut open or in an X-ray or an MRI that I understand the position. And this is becoming more and more important terms when we start talking about medical imaging and even things like the new um, virtual surgeries where they have to have the person uh, uh, in a plane and literally looking at and slicing up the person uh, and, and, and magnifying the person. They have to know where they are. So the plane is any fat surface of which you can divide the body into. We're going to see. And some important planes are going to be the sagittal plane. Okay. And you'll see how that slice in a minute. The um, mid-sagittal plane. Okay. And the parasagittal plane, which is really this one's not used too much anymore. It's mostly going to be sagittal and mid-sagittal. And this is cutting the body basically into left and right halves, which is very, you know, uh, um, externally, the body halves are generally equal. That is not true internally when we start looking at um, sagittal cuts, and particularly mid-sagittal, because mid-sagittal means equally into right and left. Then we have the frontal plane, which as you see is a slice that is um, 90 degrees different than the um, sagittal planes or the lateral planes. So this is going to cut the body into anterior or front and posterior or back. And you could also say ventral or dorsal for this too, if you want. And then there's transverse planes, which are horizontal. And there's no real half to the body. So we just sometimes just call these cross sections. So it just means I'm looking at a particular section of the body. But this is where we have to really be careful explaining superior, inferior, intermediate to a particular section. And then oblique or oblique sections, depending on what English you speak, uh, makes these diagonal cuts. And sometimes those are important, particularly when looking at cell structures and for visualizing organs like the stomach, which um, you can't really cut nicely in a, in a, in a horizontal plane. So what do these look like? So here's our um, model, and she's showing the different planes. So there's your um, frontal plane, cutting her into anterior and posterior. This is your mid-sagittal, because a regular sagittal would just kind of cut her, let's say, slice her down here or down here. So this is a mid-sagittal, cutting her directly into right and left. And then here's uh, uh, your transverse plane. This happens to be an almost mid-transverse plane. And an oblique would, call, would do something like that. And you can see where this becomes important, in, particularly in medical imaging, that you know, am I looking at the person from the anatomical position, the reverse position? Am I looking at a cross-section right here? 
okay am i looking at a sagittal section and is that mid sagittal or not so we can tell the place of the internal organs now to end this and i and this is not completely in your book but whenever we look at the human body we treat the body as if everybody's equal and that is not true and not just in height and in weight but also in body proportions so we have this statistical term we call normal and normal doesn't mean that the person is healthy it just means for this population of people this gender or ethnic group of people or just in people in general we find that their particular body proportions tend to represent anywhere from 88 percent to 90 percent of a certain parameter and this is true for blood pressure certain people's blood pressure are outside the normal range but that's normal for their body or they don't overlap the range as much as you should so when we look at this 88 to 99 percent of the body fit into what's called a statistical norm and if you do statistics that is what basically the norm is defined as it's looking at a bunch of things and seeing what is the most common so we so when you get into um, medicine you'll see a heck of a lot of variability particularly like here where nerves and even blood vessels and body organs are not in the right place and I've seen the patient where the body organs were reversed I've also seen patients where uh, um, not muscles were missing but organs were missing so but but that is their norm now of course outside the norm you can get pathology okay so and, and this is what leads us into body cavities because body cavities fit with this variation so we're going to see that we have to divide the body internally into distinct cavities that are surrounded by membranes and this is what's kind of neat about it because when physicians do surgery particularly transplants they're learning now that let's say instead of uh, um, just transplanting a heart it's easier to transplant the whole thoracic cavity with the heart and the lungs in there because it's a whole unit that works together and if you're going to get a rejection of a heart it's actually less likely funny enough to get a rejection of a thoracic cavity and and a lot of that has to do with maybe the membrane barrier i don't know and it might just be with the success rate of keeping the tissues alive so we're going to look at something called the dorsal cavity which is a large cavity that protects the nervous system and and it could be divided up into the cranial cavity which includes the brain and it is uh, connected to the vertebral cavity okay we have what's called the ventral cavity and ventral means what your front end we don't uh, some people call it the anterior cavity it's not technically uh, used a lot but this includes the thoracic cavity and what's called the abdominal pelvic cavity now some people separate the abdominal cavity from the pelvic but actually they're somewhat connected so what do these look like this is looking at what's called a lateral view I'm looking at the person from the side and this is an anterior view we don't use an, a posterior view because it, it looks something like the anterior view except in x-rays it's kind of a little confusing to sometimes figure out so here's your cranial cavity your ventral cavity I mean vertebral cavity being made up of the dorsal cavity overall that's the overall body cavity there's the cranial cavity from the frontal view or anterior view so here's your thoracic cavity which includes subcavities okay and submembranes you're going to see there's a there's a little membrane here that separates this part of the body so this is actually a minor cavity when a thoracic cavity you can see two separate cavities for the lungs which then are enclosed in another cavity okay and then there's uh the cavity around your heart which is which we call the pericardium that's one you should be familiar with and we see that there's layers of material called membranes and you learn about what are called um uh visceral and parietal membranes visceral meaning the ones that actually touch the organ parietal one means that encapsulated maybe this whole area here so these layers these membranes and cavities come in layers there's your abdominal cavity which does have a little notch in it we call the pelvic cavity so the pelvic cavity is distinct but it's still attached and communicates with 
the abdominal cavity. And again, I can ask you what organs are found in here. So if I ask you where the um, female reproductive tract is, you will say preferably pelvic cavity within the abdominal pelvic cavity. And the kidneys would be more in the abdominal cavity because they are superior to the um, reproductive tract. So um, when we look at these in more detail, the ventral body cavities, you know, in, um, can be broken up into the pleural cavities. I mentioned this earlier, the mediastinum, which contains part of the, the heart, okay, and also surrounds part of the uh, uh, large vessels that run through there and, and other areas, uh, part of the tubes of the lung. And then we have the pericardial cavity, which encloses the heart. Your abdominal, as we mentioned earlier, your ventral body cavity is broken up the abdominal pelvic, and then there's your abdominal and your pelvic. And again, just, you know, another view. So, um, the membrane that covers these cavities are called serous membranes. And serous membranes, again, I mentioned are just thin membranes, sometimes double. There's your parietal, there's your visceral, um, and they contain a, a very liquidy fluid called serous fluid. Later on, you're going to learn that these membranes are made by epithelium. That means a very thin group of cells that are a barrier. So this acts as a barrier to hold in fluids, to prevent disease, and also in the case of the lungs, to maintain a difference in air pressure. Because these are things that, these are membranes that also diffusion could occur or be stopped. So th this is a living layer of cells. Even though it doesn't look alive, it looks like plastic or fabric in the body, it's a living layer of cells that swells and produces fluids. We have diseases called pericarditis, where the serous membranes around the heart become irritated and inflamed. This is very common with bacterial diseases and viral diseases like um, shingles, for example. Okay, um, and this is just showing a close-up. Your book likes doing this of the pericardium. You can see that it's a separate sac, but there's also there's a sac that helps it to connect to the mediastinum and also to the um, hole of the uh, thoracic cavity. So you have to say, uh, so basically when you think of a cavity, think of an organ being kind of stuffed into this balloon. There's your outer layer, your parietal layer, and your visceral layer right there. And here's now this lubricating sac that can also act as uh, um, a cushion. So you can prevent trauma to the lungs, to your respiratory tree, to the heart by having this cushion. So think of this as padding too, besides being something that, that um, holds fluids and lubricates and allows the heart and the lungs to expand and contract and have this cushion there. So these are very important membranes. And sometimes these membranes are also referred to um, serosi because they produce this stuff called serous fluids. So serosa is just another term, and I do apologize for that, but we do have an overlap and duplication of terms. The abdominal pelvic region, now we're going to focus on a little. We can divide it in two ways. And why do we need to do this? Because, man, if someone comes along, and I've seen this happen before, believe me, someone comes along and sticks a giant dagger in there, you know, we'll make a little pirate dagger. Okay. Um, you know, we have to know exactly what region it was in to know what might have been injured. Particularly, I did one in the left upper quadrant, which, you know, you can puncture the stomach, okay, puncture the spleen, puncture the pancreas, and that can let loose enzymes that can digest the rest of the organs in the abdominal pelvic cavity. So we have what's called the upper quad, left quadrant, and notice, there you go, left upper quadrant quadrant, they do use this a lot, believe me. I've seen this a lot of use in um, paperwork when looking at particularly where to focus x-rays. You have the right upper quadrant, lower white quadrant, quadrant just means quarter, and lower left quadrant. And again, you do this from the anatomical position. When the person is dorsal, obviously, you have to get this <laughs> the left and right correct. So here's where the region goes. And these are called abdominal quadrants. And then we have another way we can divide it up. Now, the nine region 
way of dividing, the, I just, just said in the, the nine regions of the abdominal cavity is the most common way we divide it up. And a lot of this is because we want some specificity. So like, you know, if you're just looking at damage to this whole region, this quadrant, you can see more by dividing this up and saying, okay, something, a bullet went into here. So now you know a little more specifically of what's going on. So pay attention to the organs under here, these nine abdominal regions, because this is, uh, you know, going to be on exams and also just in general, you should know the layout of the body. And this also tells us what, you know, the norms of a person too. Because again, you can find a person with a gallbladder that is uh, positioned a little higher, a little lower, and might put it in a different region. Some other important things to know too are these terms. So we have epi, which means above. Okay, hypo, which means below. And then you have some reference terms called gastric. Gastric refers to the fact that the stomach is a big marker in there. So this is your gastric region because that's where the stomach tends to lie. And then the chondriac term is a little more difficult because this comes from ancient Greek medicine. Okay, it refers to that area right there called the chondriac area, which means the cartilage because that's what they thought they were feeling, which in actuality they were so to feel that region of you put your hands right below your chest right above the abdominal cavity and feel where your ribs end that's the chondriac region so if a structure is below that region on the left side you have what's called the left hypochondriac region which is right here okay and i know there's a disease called hypochondria because that refers to basically uh, the location of the liver in a way because the liver is you know in your right hypochondriac region here. And that was at one time considered the seat of the mind, like the brain. And most diseases were attributed to some function or, uh, of the liver. Okay, so the term chondrial, literally, had, I mean, hypochondria had to deal with uh, the uh, location of the liver. Your lumbar, this is your mid back, lower back, and then your iliac region. So you have hypochondriac, this is using parts of the body you can feel. So you can tell you the hypochondriac when you're basically um, right below the ribs, the lumbar, okay, you're between um, now the lower part of the lungs and right to where your hip bones start, and then the iliac is right where the hip bones start. So you can feel these regions, this the beginning of this region and the beginning of this region by just basically putting your hands on the patient and feeling the, the, those bones. So we have the right iliac, right lumbar, right hypochondriac. Just please pay attention to what's underneath those or what's, you know, to these what are called superficial labels. And then we have what are called minor or, uh, body cavities. And these are cavities that are not so much surrounded by membrane, but uh, uh, serous membranes, but surrounded by um, other types of membranes, some of these being mucous membranes but these also tend to be kind of wet surfaces. So we have the oral and digestive cavities, which is associated with the nasal cavity. These are all really, these are really one together. The orbital cavity where your eye is located, this is a cavity of bone. The middle ear cavity, you're gonna see this a little later inside a temporal bone. And then what are called the synovial cavities, which are um, located between major joints of the body. So this is the end of our orientation for chapter one.